Hey, the uh, information that we're going to go over here is found in section 25.5 of the fourth edition of TRO. So the question is, why crystal field theory? Why are we interested in it? And the main purpose that we use it for is to understand the origins of all the brightly colored compounds that we see when we have transi transition metal complex ions. Like, where does the color actually come from? If you remember from Bohr's model of the atom, in Bohr's model, you have a nucleus. And then, you know, we have these orbits, which, you know, are supposed to be round, but they're not in my drawings. Uh, energy goes, electron goes up in energy. That's the absorption of a photon. Energy goes, electron goes down in energy. And that's the emission of a photon. This causes the emission of light. And if you remember for the hydrogen series, the second series uh, of the hydrogen series uh, produces light in the visible range. But the question is, why do transition metal compounds do this? And so uh, as a preface to that, we're going to talk a little bit again about d orbitals. Um, and what their behavior is like, and maybe draw a couple of them sort of to get the reorient ourselves to what they look like. So in the absence of electronic effects, that actually means without any electrons in the d orbitals and without any ligands around. So like in the gas phase, or perhaps um, uh, it could be also for the situation where you have an equal number of electrons. Uh, in all the orbitals, all full or all half full or all empty in that case, um, the orbitals will have degeneracy. That means they have the same energy. Okay, so let me draw this up, but let me actually read through this real quick. So these orbitals have a unique three-dimensional geometry, you know, the cloverleaf shape, uh, and this relative uh, orientation of all the orbitals is maintained with respect to uh, like the z-axis. That is, um, when I draw these and I show you the z, uh, dz squared orbital, uh, and then I draw the other ones, I'm not just trying to imply that they have these shapes, but I'm also trying to imply they have these shapes and they maintain their position relative to each other, their orientation relative to each other, even if the atom rotates through space, okay? So I'm going to draw some of these just real quickly. I'll make a little whiteboard here. Okay, so let's say I draw my X, Y, Z like this, right? And I'm going to draw a D, Z squared. The dz squared orbital is this funny shaped one that has a lobe at the top, the bottom, and then it has a toroidal shape, like a torus kind of shape. And like that around the middle and you know, it goes around the back. I just didn't draw it you know, back here. You, it's back there, but okay. So that's dz squared. So there's also a dx squared, y squared. So I'm gonna call this z. This is x, this is y. So what we don't think about usually when we're doing gen chem is, I mean, we've got to get the idea, oh, it's on the axis and that's kind of stuff. But dx squared, y squared is on this axis. And it looks like this. It is on the axes for uh, the coordinate system that I'm drawing. And this is z, this is x. This is why. And these orbitals always maintain the same relative orientation with respect to each other. Now, there are three other orbitals. And just really quickly, these two orbitals, what's unique or what they have in common with each other that's different than the other orbitals is these are on axis. Now, if we draw the other ones very quickly. I'm going to try to sketch these up. These are a little bit harder to draw. There's D, X, Y. And if this is um, X and this is Y, then it sits in between 
the coordinate system axes like that. So it's in the plane of x, y. Then there's d, y, z, and d, y, x. And this covers actually all the coordinate planes that you might uh, visualize on an x, y, z coordinate uh, system. That is, they sit between the axes and in the plane. And there's only three of them, so then there's only three of the d orbitals. So if I try to draw this one, then it is, um, and I'm really bad at this, by the way, it's in this plane here, here, and here. Because this is y and this is z, so it's going to be in that plane. And then I'm not even going to try to do x, z, because that one just going to be horrible, but you can kind of get the idea. If I draw the coordinate system, and this is x, and this is y, and this is z, then it's going to sit in the plane defined by these two axes, okay? So, got that out of the way. So, here's what happens. You have d orbitals, and they're all degenerate, and they all have a fixed orientation relative to each other. And then we imagine what happens when a ligand brings in its non-bonded pair to form a coordinate covalent bond. Okay, so remember, uh, this is, a, uh, if, you, if you remember uh, ligands, we talked about some ligands uh, earlier in the lecture series, right? Like ammonia is an example of a ligand. There's an H down at the bottom. I can start to fit it in. So this is the lone pair or the non-bonded electrons that come in and form the bond uh, with the d orbitals um, in uh, the coordinate covalent bond of the complex ion. I think I said that okay. Anyways, for for sort of expediency. Uh, we're just going to talk about primarily uh, what happens with octahedral complexes. And then I'll show you uh, what the tetrahedral and square planar ones look like. Okay, so here we go. We boil this down to the idea that um, with the coordination number of six, so there's six ligands, uh, a good example, and the one I use in these slides actually is the simplest one to do, is FEF6. Three minus. Uh, you have six ligands. It has to be octahedral. It's sp three d two hybridization. Um, but the ligands approach along uh, the axes of an octahedron. But there's also for uh, coordination number four. That is where you have four ligands attached to a central atom. So maybe something like this. Oops, sorry, did that wrong. There's a couple of different um, geometric like possibilities. It could be a tetrahedral or it could be square planar. And what uh, crystal field theory does is it helps us explain, based on our observations of... Um, the spins of the electrons in the d orbitals uh, which geometry uh, complex ion might be taking okay okay so anyways beyond that let's go to here so in the we talk about octahedral field uh, ligands are attached at the corners of an octahedron um, and when they come in, they have to interact with the d orbitals. And the d orbitals have electrons in them. So think about this. You have ligands that have negative charge. You have d orbitals that have negative charges in them. The more they interact, okay, the more the ligand interacts with the orbital, the higher the energy of the orbital. That's the destabilization because the negative charges interacting with each other. 
Um, so if you look at the orbitals, I'm going to reverse the order of these slides, so I'm going to just skip over that slide. I'll go back to it in a second. If you look at these two orbitals, these are the dz squared orbital and the dx squared y squared orbital. These two energy, these two orbitals lie directly on the bonding axes. Um, we, we tend to think of orbitals as these freely oriented objects in space, but the actual when the ligands are attached, the orbitals have a definite orientation along the x, y, z axes for x squared, y squared, and dz squared. So these things are fixed in place. The other thing that's true then is that the other three orbitals, okay, also are fixed in place relative to x squared, y squared, and z squared. And these are the dxy, what's down here, the labels are down here, dxy, dyz, and dxz orbitals. These orbitals lie within the plane of the coordinate systems, okay, but they're off axes. And as a result, if you have, for example, let's say you have uh, an electron in this orbital, right? the interaction is further to the ligands, like this one and this one, than it would be if it was on axis. So the destabilization of these three orbitals is less than the destabilization of the z squared and the x squared, y squared, that is less than these two, where if the electron density, if there's electron density in this orbital, right, then, then what ends up happening is the interaction is direct and the destabilization is high. So when you take that into consideration and you raise the energies of the orbitals according to their interactions, and this is on a relative scale because we haven't really quantified like how, how much the destabilization is. No matter how you do it, x squared, y squared, and z squared are always going to be higher than the other three orbitals. And as a result, there's this split in the energies. And so what we say is that these ones on the left, these ones are degenerate. Degeneracy meaning have the same energy. These are no longer degenerate and they are split and so the delta implies, it's, the, it's called the delta. The delta is um, created that separates the energies of the upper and lower energy states. So when you think about what's happening here, and you think about, um, like when we studied the Bohr model of the atom, right? And in the Bohr model of the atom, you had a nucleus and you had orbitals, awesome. And electrons would go up in energy like this, and then they would drop down in energy and they'd release a photon. If you remember from the experiment we looked at a long time ago, there's line spectra for hydrogen. And in line spectra for hydrogen, that's an emission spectrum. So light is being shot out of the atom after it is excited. Uh, in our experiment, we used electrical energy and thermal energy, basically, to excite the electrons to higher energy levels. And then when the electrons drop down from n equals 3 to n equals 2, for example, photons were emitted, and that was the color of light we saw. But it's also true that as the electrons go up in energy, uh, they're affecting the light that you see. Um, and so, for example, and that would be called an absorbent spectrum. <clears throat> in, in our case, the emission is stronger than the absorbent, so I don't think that's, I think that's why you don't see them simultaneously. Otherwise, it turns out that the lines wouldn't be there. But what's going to happen in transition metal complexes is el electrons will be promoted to this higher energy level. And when they're at the higher energy level, they will then again drop down to lower energy level and presumably emit either light or heat um, uh, molecular motion. So this is really an absorbent type of behavior and when it when the photons are absorbed from going from this lower energy level to the higher energy level that's going to result in a color that you see in the complex ion. Okay, so uh, let's go down to the next slide. 
this thing, the splitting energy, this delta, uh, is the size of it is affected by a couple of different things. Uh, one of them has to do with the charge of the ion, and the other one, though, has to do with the ligand itself. So let's say you're looking at iron, and you're looking at two different ligands. If a ligand has more charge to it or can't interact with the d orbitals more strongly, uh, that causes that gap, this gap here, this gap will grow in size. On the other hand, if if the if the ligand is weak, so we call these weak field ligands. Oops, sorry, back, back, back. Then what will happen is this gap will be small, and that will affect how the electrons arrange themselves between those two orbitals. So if you remember Hund's rule, right? Hund's rule, if you just have d orbitals like we, we do on the left over here, Hund's rule says, well, let's say I had five electrons in here. However, I got to five electrons. When you go up to this next level, well, you would expect something like this. Because we have, remember, Hund's rule is for degenerate orbitals. But if the orbitals are no longer degenerate, they will have this possibility where two of the electrons will go up to the higher energy level and two of the electrons go into the lower energy level. And that is what I've sort of shown over here. Well, what determines that? I mean, why does it go to the higher level? Why doesn't it go to the bottom level? And the, and the answer is actually pretty straightforward. If I put electrons down in this lower level, then what ends up happening is these two electrons repel each other. So we call this electron-electron repulsion. And we talk about it in Chem 1A just uh, as well. Well, if the repulsion is high enough, and, when, and if honestly, if, if we're doing like this, consistently I'd have five electrons on the right so it would look something like that. If the electron electron repulsion is smaller than this delta this is actually what you see. Electron repulsion is a repulsive energy and if it's smaller than the delta then the electron can stay down in the lower energy level and that represents the ground state for example. On the other hand if if this electron electron repulsion is bigger than the delta that is there's more repulsion there then what ends up happening back up in my drawing then the electrons get pushed up okay so this is the situation you see in a weak field so weak field ligands produce a high amount of spin. So this is high spin. On the other hand, a strong field ligand, when the split is bigger, in a strong field ligand, this split is large and you end up not being able to promote the electrons to the higher energy level and you end up dropping the two electrons to the bottom. We measure this by measuring the paramagnetism of uh, the complex ion. And if you remember, paramagnetism has to do with unpaired electrons. If it's paramagnetic, it has unpaired electrons and it has a magnetic moment. The larger the magnetic moment, the more likely it's a high spin complex. And the, in the strong field ligands, which cause the electrons to drop to the lower energy level are more likely to produce less magnetism or low spin complexes. So what determines the delta? I think I just mentioned it. it's the strength of the ligand interaction. And so there's a list. It's called the spectrochemical series, and I'll give you the full list laid out. But the strongest field ligands include things like CN- minus and NO2-. Minus. The weakest field ligands include things like I minus and Br minus. Now, it's easy to kind of understand the distinction for most of these, but some of them, it just has to do with the way these particular orbitals overlap with the orbitals of the metal ion. But like Cn minus, NO2 minus, you expect those to be relatively strong field ligands because they have a negative charge, and then where the negative charge is located on a nitrogen or oxygen. On the other hand, 
uh, like OH minus, you might expect to be similar to those, and it just turns out OH minus tends to be weaker uh, than those. But you could also understand why I minus is a weak field ligand because it's large, and the negative charge on the I minus is relatively diffuse, and so the interaction with the orbitals is relatively weak. Metal ion charge also increases the ligand interaction. So if you have cobalt 3 plus versus manganese 2 plus, the 3 plus ions tend to have stronger interactions with the ligands. That is, the positive charge causes the ligands to move in more closely. And as a result, you get more uh, splitting between the higher and lower levels of the d orbitals. OK, so. Um, This produces the color. As the light is absorbed, uh, what happens is is the, um, the remaining light is the color that you see. So it's different than uh, what you see with like hydrogen, where that's an emission spectra. This is really an, uh, an absorbance behavior. So the thing about light is being white light. And when we talk about white light, I think you generally understand that's all the wavelengths of light uh, represented in the spectrum. If you look at this coordination compound solution that's in here, you'll see this bright purple. If you look at its absorbance spectrum, you're going to see that the absorbance is within right these regions. The highest absorbance is toward about 500 to 600. So that means on the color wheel, what you're really doing is you're removing, for example, this sort of 500 to 600 range. And, and in principle, what that leaves you with, what you see, is mostly purple. And, and it's this whole you know, color wheel complementary color thing that you know, I'm not very good with, but if I have a color wheel, I can look at it and say, well, if I'm absorbing 500 to 600, I'll see the opposite colored light. That's about 400, that kind of thing. Okay, so um, color can be, that we see is related to the splitting energy. Um, you can think of it like this. If you remember, the energy of a photon is equal to h nu, nu being e being the energy of the photon, right? h is Planck's constant. It's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. And v, it's actually nu. That's frequency, and it's in 1 over seconds. Now, there's another uh, real common uh, form of this equation, which is the one you most likely will use um, for this kind of uh, calculation. It's equal to E is equal to HC over lambda. And that comes from the relationship that C divided by lambda is the wavelength. Uh, and you can write it like this, C times lambda, sorry, nu times lambda equals the speed of light and that's the substitution we'll use to get to this bottom equation okay so you can tell the energy of a photon um, by measuring the maximum like this is one of the this is a wavelength of maximum absorption if you can plug 500 uh, nanometers. Now, this calculation, the wavelength has to be in meters, uh, so you need to do that conversion, but that'll tell you the energy of the photon. The other thing that you can do is if you know the energy of the photon, you can calculate, uh, of course, the, the maximum wavelength of the photon absorbed, and then you can kind of predict like what color you would see based on the wavelength of maximum absorption. So like I said, there's high spin and there's low spin complexes. Um, this is a, a D6 compound. And you'll notice that it has two spin states. Uh, if, Fe, if you have FeCN6, C, oh, that parenthesis is wrong. I did that in here, too. Um, this parenthesis should be on the inside here. And the 6 is on the outside. Um, if you have FeCN6, that's a low spin 
uh, complex because cyanide is a strong field ligand, which causes that to be large. If you have water, water is a relatively weak field ligand, so that means this will be small, and the electrons, rather than being paired at the bottom like they are down here, all right, they'll jump up to the higher level like they show here. All right. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole tetrahedral uh, analysis for like the splitting because uh, it takes a while to do these things, but we're going to sort of take it on faith that this is how it works. In principle, though, you can kind of see that when you, if you if you make the z-axis orientation like this, and the ligands come in in a tetrahedral field, they're coming in off-axis. That is, tetrahedral field is off-axis to x, y, and z-axis. Okay, and as a result, um, the x, y, and z orbitals, that's dx squared, y squared, and dz squared, these are lower in energy because they don't directly interact with the orbitals, but all three of these, it turns out, go to a higher energy level. And so you end up with um, three orbitals in the upper level and two orbitals in the lower level. So let's say you have a tetrahedral and you have uh, five electrons or six electrons in there. One, two, three, uh, actually four, five you would have something like this, one, two, um, three, four, five. Turns out delta in these complexes is small, and as a result, they tend to be high spin. Um, so let's leave that at that, and we're going to go to, Actually, let me do six. Even numbers are nicer to work with. So we'll go something like that, and then the next one would go down here. So you kind of know where that electron will go. Let's look at square planar. So in a square planar, I wish they had drawn the octahedral shape here, because you get square planar when you have lone pairs of electrons up at the top. Oop, I don't know how I just did that, but I just killed the presentation. So let's go back. see here. Yeah, square planar. Uh, this is the situation where you have um, two electrons at the top and two electrons at the bottom. That gives you the square planar arrangement and a transition metal complex. Sorry, letting the cat in the house. Okay, so in a square planar, uh, the x squared, y squared orbital is very high in energy because on our coordinate system, right, and these are coming in on x squared and y squared. Now, x, y is high and z is high. Um, the reason for that is because um, z squared has this donut shape in the middle. So if I were to draw that on there, right, I'm going to erase it after I draw it though. It looks like this. There's pretty strong interaction uh, with this torus, which has electron density with these. Okay, I'm going to back that out now so I can show you the, the other one. Um, in, in the plane, it turns out there's more interaction with this orbital, the one that sits in the plane here, and that would be dxy. And so what you'll see, right, again, x squared, y squared, that's the highest up here. XY is the next highest. Z squared is the next highest. And then XZ and YZ, those are out of the plane and off axis, have relatively weak interactions. The result is is that it's low spin. Um, and, and that's because uh, this energy gap between here and here and here and here and here and here because of the direct interaction with the uh, Ax on axis orbitals is pretty high and as a result the energies between these levels are pretty high and then, and then as a result the electrons tend to reside in the bottom level so if you put in six electrons like I did it in this one you're gonna get one two three four five six like that and then the, all the electrons will be unpaired now going back to the previous slide right if I put 
six electrons into this slide, right? It tends to go like this. Oops, I did it again. It tends to go like this. And you'll you'll have relatively high spin. So one will be no spin, that's diamagnetic, and one will be high spin, which is paramagnetic. So the way you can tell the difference between tet one of the ways you see the difference between tetrahedral and uh, square planar is the amount of spin that's exhibited in the two complex ions. So if you're just given a formula and you want to know what sh is the shape of the complex ion, you look at the spin and the spin helps you determine which one is which. Okay, so that basically um, ends. That's why I went to this. That basically ends um, our lecture for this and if you have any questions feel free always you can contact me and now you can see my desktop full of junk all right